Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event or a webinar, a webcast, an online show, whatever you want to call us. Um, we're here live every Wednesday morning online at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, the show is free and open to anyone to watch, both our live shows on Wednesday mornings or our recordings. Recordings are all posted up to our website for anyone to watch afterwards. And we do a mixture of things here, uh, presentations, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions, basically anything library related, we are happy to put it on the show. We bring in guest speakers sometimes, and we sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff on, and this week we have... The latter, yes. Library Commission staff. Yes. <laughs> um, earlier <coughs> this year, no, last year. Last year. It's very year. early this year already. Yes. Yeah. Um, last year we started a new series, so to speak, of um, doing some sh shows about books that Library Commission staff are reading. Actually, it started last January with uh, hot titles for a cold month. Mm -hmm. um, and then we did a uh, romance novel one, romance topic. And now our next one here today is Guys Read, Men of the NLC Talk Books. Um, we have two of our male employees. We have more men that work here. Yes, yeah, we're not the only two. <laughs> so let's clarify that. We do not have only two guys working at the Library Commission. These are just the only two that we could... Uh, uh, we're available right. for let's today. That, yes. <laughs> that um, we're available to come on the show today and share um, what they've been reading recently. Yep. Guess, or just what they're interested in. We have uh -huh. Michael Sowers. Um, who's right here next to me, and Sam Shaw over to his side there. And they're just going to go through. We've got a um, presentation here that is um, online. And afterwards, just so you know, so you don't have to ask me about it, we will have a list of this available in some format after the show. So you'll have a list of all the titles that they mentioned that you'll be able to refer to later um, if you decide that you want to um, purchase any books for your library or get a hold of them. Or, or whatever, read them or, yourself. Or just read them yourself to check yes. them out. Yes, yeah, so there will be a, a list available afterwards that will have all of these available for you um, along with the recording of the show. Um, other than that, I think we're good to go. I'll just hand it over to you guys. All right. Take over and tell us what you got for us. Uh, well, I'm Michael Sowers. I'm the Technology Innovation Librarian at the Nebraska Library Commission. And sitting next to me is... Sam Shaw, the Planning and Data Services Coordinator here. So all of you Nebraska librarians that are filling out those surveys, that's, that's <laughs> Sam. <laughs> Survey time. Uh, and I'm, you know, resident geek, basically, and, and WordPress person and things like that. So um, Laura, who's can kind of putting together these uh, book talk series, asked yeah, Laura us. Laura Johnson is our CE coordinator mm -hmm. here at Continuing Education. It's her idea to come up with these um, yep. regular shows of us sharing our... Uh, reading interests mm -hmm. from the library commission staff. So uh, what Sam and I have basically are six books each that we're going to talk about uh, to varying degrees that we've all uh, read relatively recently, I guess. They're, it doesn't mean they're new books per se, uh, but books we've re read relatively recently, uh, and also books that should be readily available for you to be able to purchase for your library or for yourself. Uh, I was joking with Sam a little earlier that I'm currently reading, uh, another book I'm reading is a 30-year-old horror novel in a limited edition of 200 copies. Not something you're easily going to find for, for your collection. So we, we, we've kind of skipped uh, those. Uh, so we're just going to kind of alternate, and I think uh, I'm up first, if I remember, since I put these slides together. Um, and click there. Okay. Um, I'm also going to admit that I'm kind of cheating on a couple of these. Um, when asked to pick six books, a couple of them are um, series or trilogies. Uh, and we'll start out with this one now. It is called the Parasitology Trilogy, but you'll notice I only have two books up there. Uh, that's because book one came out last year uh, with Parasite. Book two, uh, Symbiont, came out in uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I believe. And actually, I haven't read it yet. It's on deck. Uh, I will be reading it uh, very shortly. Um, and the third book will be out next year, and I don't have a title for that one, so I'm kind of cheating here. Uh, Mira Grant is uh, a pseudonym for an author, to be honest, I can't remember her actual name. And she wrote a series of books called uh, the, um, I've forgotten the other name of the series, but it was a zombie trilogy that she wrote, and I really enjoyed them. And there was a, a cross with um, uh, blogging. Uh, she, she took zombies in the post-apocalypse, but then uh, also... Mm -hmm. 
Yes, deadline was the first one. Our feed was the first one. Oh, okay. um, deadline was, uh, yeah, uh, was the second one, and, and Black, I was a uh, uh, Shannon McGuire. Um, and so, you know, as a blogger and a zombie fan, I just, I, I latched onto those, and she's a great writer. So she's now on her second trilogy, um, and she is uh, calling it the Parasitology Trilogy. Uh, instead of zombies, this time she's writing about parasites. So in the first book, the premise is that... Um, there have been medical advancements in the near future, and there are uh, there is this new breed of parasite that you can be given that will actually improve your health. Okay, so there's there's our there's our basis right there. Um, but then um, at the beginning of the book, peop some people who have these parasites are starting to kind of lose control of their bodies and and not become zombies as we know them, but more zombified as in blank stairs and whatever. And, no and way it went wrong. It, well, <laughs> something went wrong. Um, and wow. and I'll give you enough of the punchline that the parasites have become sentient and want control of the bodies. Uh, so uh, maybe, you know, not as good as the thing you want. Um, but she has done a lot of research into parasites. I was just uh, watching a, a talk with her she gave at Google. She actually had a parasite for quite a while intentionally as part of research, uh, a kind of a benign mm -hmm. parasite. Oh, um, oh yeah, no, no, she goes all in into, into her um. research. So they're not really, these are not really horror novels as much as this all sounds kind of gross. These are science fiction kind of in, uh, in the vein of, uh, of uh, a Michael Crichton, so, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. They're pretty thick books, but they're, you know, three, uh, 400 pages or so, but they, they're really quick reads, very action-oriented. Um, you know, bioethics, um, you know, who, who owns the parasite, the company or the person? Or now that the parasite's sentient, is it the parasite? Do they get rights? I mean, this is, you know, all of these, so there's legal issues in, involved in here. Um, and I really enjoy her writing, very, very, uh, like I said, action-oriented and, and easy to read. Um, you can probably get through it, you know, in a, in a couple of days or a week, depending on how fast uh, you're a reader. Um, so that kind of gives you a little peek into my mind just right off the top as to what sort of book I like. Um, so um, I, I think that's what I've got to say here. I, I, like I said, as soon as I finish the two books I'm in the middle of, one of which I'll be talking about later, uh, I will symbiont is next on my list. So I'll, I'll definitely be moving on to that. Uh, Sam? Oh, you put that one first? Oh, okay. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> Um, this is a book that I read recently called Creative Confidence by Tom and David Kelly. Um, David Kelly, I don't know, uh, both David and Tom Kelly, brothers Kelly, um, are the founders of the IDO um, company. And David Kelly is the founder of the D School at Stanford University. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. Um, basically, this book... And, and I, I, I found them um, from a Google talk, too, that they did um, together that I would highly recommend. Um, <clears throat> but um, this book deals with um, what they call creative confidence. Um, and it's a, it's, you'll probably find it in the business section, but I think it's a refreshing change from a lot of books that are in the business section, which mm -hmm. are generally like The Art of War and <laughs> 33 Strategies yeah. of War and anything by Robert Greene. Um, their approach is a little bit different um, in dealing with um, creativity um, that we all have, but that is stymied um, oftentimes by um, our upbringing. Um, you know, when kids are kids are generally creative, um, but oftentimes um, made fun of when they're young, and so they have a hard time bringing ideas to the table. And so um, David and Tom Kelly talk about how um, we can unleash that creative potential in us. And um, I think that um, for me it's um, interesting that they focus on um, empath building empathetic relationships in work environments, hmm. which is kind of the opposite approach from what we were talking about with 33 Strategies of War and Art of War. And yeah, a lot like less that. confrontational. A lot less confrontational, more um, team building, um, <clears throat> which um, uh, really hit home for me. I, I really like this book. So, did you write a blog post about this? I did this? write a blog oh, okay. post about this. I thought, yeah, that, thought it about, sounded familiar. the creative confidence. And I, and I would 
recommend the Google Talk. I think David Kelly's been on um, 60 Minutes a couple of times and talking about the D School out in Stanford and how they generally bring people from different environments together and function effectively as teams um, in bringing ideas to the table and then building on those ideas. So um, this book had a lot of appeal for me in the business sense. Cool. As a refreshing change from from what's generally there. Yeah. Well, before we started, I told Krista there'd be no links to point to, and now we've both mentioned uh, Google Talks that we can probably find a link to. <laughs> for me. Yeah. yeah. We'll, add those. <laughs> well, we'll we'll find them. We we promise. But actually, be. Um, I don't remember. We'll see. Um, but it, it, talk. It, I'll just throw in here a talks at Google. If you go to YouTube and find talks at Google, they have hundreds of people a year come to Google and talk to their staff, uh, from musicians oh, yeah. to artists to cooks to writers to whatever. And I watch a lot of those, and I, it sounds like too. you do too. It's, so they're really good. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah and, and so okay. Um, all right, The Martian by Andy Weir, and I put the audio version on this because I did actually listen to this. On audio, it is a you can buy it as a uh, print or electronic novel. Also, uh, I am going to really highly recommend the audio version of this one, though. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a, another science fiction novel, but pure science in that uh, there is a team on Mars, and uh, they're there for a, a scientific mission. And a storm whips up, and they have to abort the mission. And one guy gets left behind. Mm -hmm. They think he's dead, but he does actually survive. And but it's going to take the better part of I think something like 400 plus days to get a rescue ship to him, wow. and so he has to survive. He's a botanist, so how are we going to grow stuff on Mars? Now they have kind of a habitat to start with mm -hmm. that he can work with, but um, in the end he does have to actually um, uh, get across a significant proportion of the planet to where they may or may not be able to pick him up. Uh, he has to survive by figuring out how to get water and how to get food uh, because most of that was destroyed in the storm. And I love the audiobook because the vast majority of the book is told in first person. It is him narrating the thing. So, okay, you can probably guess, yeah, okay, in the end he does get rescued because how else could he tell the story? But that's not the point. It's really how does he survive. And um, I did see another interview with this author not on Google. Uh, this time talking about it, and he said he talked to a lot of folks at NASA, he talked to a lot of scientists, he's pretty much a scientist himself too, and he said at one point there's only like one technical mistake in all of the things that he did to help this guy try to figure out how to survive, uh, but he won't actually tell anybody what it is, if you can find it, good for you. <laughs> um, but all of the math he talks about works. Um, all of the planetary science works. All of the, you know, how are you going to navigate uh, on Mars without a map uh, to get from point A to point B. How are they going to communicate with Earth because they do eventually figure out that he has survived because they do have satellites over Mars, um, but he has no direct communication. Uh, so it is this experience of being the only guy on Mars. And this guy has the most sarcastic sense of humor. <laughs> too. So, you know, he'll be like, you know, suck that Mars. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, every little victory and, and things like that. And so the, and the, um, one of the other parts that I won't go into too much detail of is, so the rest of the team got off the planet and got into the shuttle to go home. Well, Earth figures out he's still alive. They think he's dead. Do they tell them or not? The rest of the team that is coming back to Earth. Because it's going to take them a long time to get back to Earth. And they're going um, to be so, like, so oh, there's, no, we left him behind. Right, exactly. So, is, you know, so there's moral issues to deal with. Is Do you let the rest of the team know he's not actually dead just for morale or nothing, you know, things like that? Would morale be worse if they were told? Would um, they try and turn around and go back? Would, would they try to turn around? Exactly. I mean, so, um, and, you know, if you're in the botany, I've got to tell you, this is a great little thing about it. Trying to figure out how to grow potatoes on Mars. Mm -hmm. So, you said yes. To do, the, do you know who the reader is? I do Sometimes. not know who the reader is off the top of my head. There are, yeah, I know some, some readers are not that good. I liked this guy, um, so if that helps, but that's my opinion. So, um, it's not the author; it, it is a professional reader. Uh, but yeah, I listen to it on audio, and I think I think it's a great audio uh, read. Definitely, and I, I'm trying to get my wife to listen to it. Cause Did you find the mistake? No, oh, no. <laughs> I, I mean, 
I grasp all the concepts that he was talking about, but you know, but he literally goes into you know, if if I can make X number of liters of water per day based on this, how many liters of water would I need to survive for three hundred days? And I, it sounds boring, but his attitude about explaining it and how he does it actually is is really good. So. Um, Kind of a, a fun read again. Uh, science fiction. No, all my books are science fiction. I promise. Um, but uh, so I went. I wanted to throw an audio book in there too. I mean, that was, was really good. And I do believe this is going to be up for like a Hugo or a Nebula or something. They're they're in the nomination stage. But I think this this is definitely an award winning novel. Uh, at least it should be. Let's put it that way. So, moving on. Oh, you picked that one second. I, I it was purely random. <laughs> <laughs> this is a book I read recently when I got stuck in the Dallas airport. About month ago. I had, I had this book with me and a book by Ken Wilber. And uh, Ken Wilber just didn't, wasn't going to do Not airport reading? Not yeah. material. So um, this is a book by Alec Baldwin. I think uh, Mark Tabb, probably somebody else, yeah, Mark Tabb um, wrote with him. Um, and I've always liked Alec Baldwin. Um, I found this in the news section at the public library. He talks about... Um, well, the subtitle is A Journey Through Fatherhood and Divorce. He talks about his, his divorce process and his relationship with his daughter and how that, um, how that was difficult for him. And I think a lot of us know the tabloid stories um, associated with his divorce and his, his infamous phone call mm -hmm. that was recorded. Um, but we don't know a lot of the background to that. And um, in this in this book, he provides a lot of the background of what he was going through with the process of his divorce, um, and also the um, the uh, family law system. Um, and I think it's important because there's not a, really a lot of books um, about fatherhood. Um, a lot of the books that are out there about fatherhood and divorce <clears throat> are um, written by the uh, the legal system and not necessarily mm -hmm. biographical. Mm -hmm. And so. I found this book interesting because, um, and it is a somewhat Hollywoodized version of the process, but um, I don't think that discounts his experience. Um, when you read the book, you don't get that impression, although, you know, he spent millions of dollars on attorney's fees, but you don't get that impression that, you know, you're listening to, um, you know, that type of a person. You, you get the impression that, you're, that, you know, this is someone with genuine concerns about their kids. Um, in going through this process, and so I found that um, um, found that he came across uh, you know as being very genuine in the book. So um, yeah, I would recommend this for your collection if you um, don't have a lot on fatherhood. There's not a lot out there. This mm -hmm. is something that I think would be a welcome addition. I obviously don't read enough tabloids. I have no idea about this phone <clears throat> call. You don't need to tell me, but I was just like, man, I, I, I miss this story. <laughs> He was yeah. frustrated with with um, visitation and phone calls to his daughter. I, mean, Ooh, I think it was okay. like uh, twelve years old at the time, mm -hmm. and suspected that his wife was um, on the other line and, and denying him phone access. And so he left a, a voice message that was um, not good, <laughs> and it was recorded. <laughs> Upon and reflection, not a good idea. Right? Gotcha. Okay. So. Wow. All right. Okay, what have I got? Okay, here's my here here's my next cheat, um, and series. yeah, it's another series I know, and I've read two of them. I haven't read the third one, but I'm going to. Um, and you may not actually find these particular editions that I I picture here. Uh, the first it's it's the Wool trilogy, uh, W O O L, uh, Wool followed by Shift followed by Dust. Um, the backstory to this is Hugh Howey is one of those um, kind of success stories in self-publishing. Uh, Wool was originally, I believe, published at, on his blog. Uh, then he self-published it in electronic editions and has since been gotten um, uh, major publisher support uh, and publishing contracts. And this is actually the, the, uh, the, the pictures I hear here from some small press limited editions uh, that, that I got a hold of. So, he is really a, a, a success story, and I kind of, I sometimes tend to obst be a little obstinate about, oh, that person's a success and everybody's reading it, so I'm not going to. I finally did, and I read Wool in about two sittings. Uh, I immediately read Shift, and then I decided to take a break, and, and I'll get to uh, uh, Dust uh, shortly. 
Um, the idea behind wool is, again, it's science fiction. I, I picked a lot of science fiction uh, this time. In that people live, uh, basically the world has ended, uh, so it's a bit of a dystopia. Uh, people live in an underground silo. And so the society has built up uh, in that kind of the, the, the lower level people are kind of the poor and the working class, and then there's the mid-level people, and then the, the ruling class kind of live up top, and you can see out into the barren wasteland, uh, but every once in a while some people for punishment or other reasons uh, get, a, get, get the privilege, and I'll use that in quotes, or the punishment of uh, leaving the silo and um, going out into the wasteland in a suit that um, may or may not be constructed all that well. <laughs> um, but of course there is a complete backstory to how this society got created and that's what's covered in Shift. Shift actually takes place before the end of the world and the creation of this. Um, but the, the, the point of wool or the, the kind of the conflict in wool is somebody discovers that the silo that they're living in is not actually the only one. There are others. And so who gets to know that there are others and why do people know that there are others or don't get to know that there are others? Um, and so there's kind of a bit of that's the mystery behind the main story. Shift is the backstory as to uh, why this occurs. Uh, Dust, I haven't read yet, so I'm not, I don't know. Uh, so you don't know the what, second what, what, books, why they're in the no. cabin. I mean, Correct. Them in the yes, second. you don't, you I mean, yeah. Why I needed to go in the Right, book. right. It just, you know, in wool, the silos are the world, and that is what people know. You don't know why that is the world. You don't know what happened to the world. In Shift, you do find out. Please, however, read these in order. Do not try to read Shift first. Don't ever do that. Read them in the order they were written. Um, because, yeah, he, he, authors do that on purpose. <laughs> um, because if you do read Shift first, you won't have the surprises that you have in Wool uh, to the mysteries and, and what's explaining there. So you can buy at least Wool, very, you buy all of them very cheaply electronically. I don't know if they're available in Overdrive. Uh, they are available in print. You can buy them through Amazon and whatnot. Um, but um, kind of if you're looking for, um, I think a great recommendation here is if you have um, young adults who have read all the YA dystopia stuff. They like the Hunger Games. They like the, the Divergence. They, they like all those. But they're looking for something different and um, a little more of an, an adult level. I, I would have no problem with a teenager reading these books. Uh, they're not YA. They are written for adults. But teens could easily read these and understand them. And I would say probably in, in some of the YA stuff, there might be more things that some parents would be offended by than the stuff that's in these books. Um, so... Uh, maybe a great recommendation for, for some kids who are looking for some, you know, next step, but still in that vein, I think. Um, and I'm going to throw in here, too, just because we're guys, we're not saying, like, women can't read these books. These are great books. It's just we're guys, and that's, this is what we're reading. So uh, kind of like they're, they're, I, I was asked to do the romance panel, and I, I, I passed. I, was, I just don't read any romance. So mm -hmm. there you go. All right. Uh, Sam's up again. Oh. That one? Um, that one? Yeah, okay. Now you're just giving me a hard time. <laughs> oh, man. I wrote a blog post about this book, actually. Oh, did you? Okay. I missed that one. This is a book by a guy that I really like. His name's Thomas Moore. This is, I think you'll find this in the self-help section a lot of the time, um, called Dark Nights of the Soul. Do you know what a Dark Night of the Soul is? Uh, no. No. A Dark Night of the Soul is generally something very big that happens in your life, like, a sense a loss. Someone dies. Uh, the end of a meaningful relationship. Um, a a life-threatening uh, illness. Um, some things that we all go through at some point in our lives. Um, and Thomas More um, spends part of the book talking about you know different dark nights of the soul that you might experience. But also um, in the second part of the book offers kind of a blueprint of how to deal with those dark nights of the soul. I think that um, takes, he takes a much different approach than um, we would generally hear, which is, you know, you're supposed to get over this and push it back and not, uh, not think about it, you know, move past it so that you don't, um, um, you know, you don't have that negative experience anymore in your life. But what he talks about is a totally different approach, which is to say, how can you use this event as a catalyst 
for a change in your life or how can you use it to build on um, making you a different and better person. And, <clears throat> um, you know, this book may have appeal to people that are going through a dark night of the soul or that have gone through a dark night of the soul. And there's different words for dark night of the soul. Some people call it the void. Mm. I've heard in some, um, in some circles. Um, but basically it's any life changing event that you go through. Um, you know, a sense of loss, death, divorce, um, those types of things that we all experience. And so I think that, um, you know, this book offers kind of a blueprint for dealing with that, um, you know, outside of maybe psychotherapy, although I think that Thomas Moore is a, a psychotherapist on the East Coast, um, but I think takes a much different approach than what you would normally see from that industry. So I, I like this book. I think it spoke to me at a certain time in my life that, that, um, that was good for me. So I think it's um, a self-help book that's different than a lot of the self-help books that you would normally see so well, great yeah oh, i think as much as they're learning about this book they're learning things about us too mm -hmm. I think so. that's <laughs> probably it that's, they're probably not stereotypical men books yeah i i yeah that's pretty okay. random so all right okay so here's my last cheat and this is not science fiction well you it, they, these are horror novels okay um they are vampires okay these vampires do not sparkle. Okay, these 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 are you know um, I'm I've I've been a vampire fan for a long time. I've read a lot of vampire books, but it 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 takes a bit to impress me uh, when it comes to this stuff because it's it's so easy to do uh, and things like that. So and how this stuff is being published is very different because what we've actually got here is two anthologies. And a graphic novel. So uh, let me yeah. well, let me give you the basic story, and then I'll tell you how the books work. Um, the basic story is that uh, vampirism is actually a genetic thing. Okay, it's kind of like a genetic disease. Uh, that the 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 stories of vampires from around the world do have a basis in fact, but the genetic uh, thing that causes vampirism has been gone for so long that it is transformed into myth at this point. Okay. Um, a scientific uh, exploration is going on up in, uh, and no, no, it's not scientific, it's a, um, it's a, a movie uh, film, filming is going on up in the Arctic. And because of global warming, they, the disease that causes vampirism actually gets re-released because it's been buried in the ice. Oh. For so long, okay. So we have a patient climate zero. Change. Yes, climate change. <laughs> so there is some science in this, right? Yeah, okay. So um, there is a, uh, a, um, a Hollywood actor comes back. He's patient zero uh, for this, okay. But not just you know vampirism gets turned on. If if you look at vampire uh, mythology, different parts of the world have different vampire myths, but the but what a vampire is is a little different. Well, this is the genetic differences. So you have people now, because of this, becoming vampires, but there are different kinds of vampires depending on their genetic heritage. Uh, so not all vampires are the same. Okay, so that's the basic storyline. And it kind of works sort of like the, um, uh, the um, World War Z book did, is it's kind of sort of diarist from some perspective. Is that, okay? Now, here's how the publishing works. The two anthologies, uh, the V Wars and then V Wars Blood and Fire. V Wars came out about two years ago. Uh, v Wars Blood and Fire came out at the end of last year. Um, they are anthologies, so you have multiple stories written by different authors. But you don't read story one, then story two, then story three. They actually intersperse the stories, you know, story one, part one, story two, part two, story three, and then it'll, it'll kind of jump back. So they all kind of intertwine with each other. So it's an anthology by multiple authors, but not a straight through their, 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 that intertwining of the stories, which works really, really well, and takes the stories from different time periods and different um, points of view as to what's going on with different types of vampires. The original V Wars takes place kind of with the discovery and the happening and leading up to the Vampire War. V Wars Blood and Fire takes place after the first Vampire War, 
with uh, kind of a, a hesitant truce. Okay? But there are also comic books and graphic novels, which is that first one over on the right there. The comic books are the war. So we kind of have a cross-platform storytelling here. Um, you can read the anthologies, the, 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 the narrative fiction on its own. It does, it does stand up. But if you then want the story of the war that takes place in between those two books, you pick up the graphic novel collections of the comics. And I've read a couple of those also. So if you like kind of that multi-platform storytelling, if you like vampires, you like short stories, but you like vampires that, you know, have they don't have bite. I don't believe it. I did not set that up. I promise. You know, really scary vampires. This is sort of the, the story you want to look at. And I, I think these, these really uh, rank very high on my list when it comes to really good vampire fiction. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I, I kind of felt I had to throw in a graphic novel, too, after I saw Sam's list. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get so to that. So the vampires have different powers? Yeah. So some different. vampires can go out and light. Some can. Mm. Um some vampires really have to feed all the time. Some are more like uh, when they feed, it's more they feed psychically on people's energy, not necessarily their blood. So, you know, if you've read a lot of vampire lore, they're not all Count Dracula, I want to stop your blood. They are, you know, very different sorts of things. Some are super aggressive. And, oh, by the way, the sec by the second book, you also get werewolves. Uh, so it, it, it gets really, really interesting. And, you know, if you're not into this, you're not going to be into this. But if you like this sort of stuff, I highly recommend it. So, all right. Back to Sam. Iron War. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> sports book. Hey. But a different kind of sport. Not a traditional sport. This, is, this book is maybe difficult for you to find. Uh, I think it's a um, uh, smaller press in Colorado. I think it's Velo Press. I'm not sure. It's a story about um, two triathletes, uh, and I think the book would have appeal to not just triathletes, but maybe runners, cyclists, swimmers, sports enthusiasts. Um, the book, the first part of the book describes um, separately, I think, the two careers of these two guys that you see in the slide. The one on the left is Dave Scott, and the one on the right is Mark Allen, both of... Um, whom won the Hawaii Ironman World Championship six times. Um, <clears throat> Dave Scott kind of in the early years, the, early, the late 70s, when it was first getting its start. And so when um, the author describes Dave Scott's career, he, he also describes the early history of the Ironman World Championship Triathlon. And uh, so you get kind of a little bit of that background, which is real interesting, you know, to see where it started, you know, I think it was like 12 or 15 guys that did the race initially, to where it's today, which is a huge, you know, multi-billion dollar business. Um, and then Mark Allen, who um, <clears throat> got his start a little later than Dave Scott, but went on to win the, the world championship six times. Um, and these two guys were huge, huge, huge rivals. I mean, and very different personalities. Um, Dave Scott, kind of old school, I'll go out and train, you know, train hard all the time. Um, and Mark Allen, kind of like a Zen master who, you know, <laughs> was one of the early um, heart rate monitor trainers uh, who wore a heart rate monitor and stuck closely with that and very regimented with his training um, and, and diet. Um, although Dave Scott had some, there's some dietary stories about him, about how he used to rinse his cottage cheese before he ate it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> regimented in that sense. Um, the second part of the book describes the rivalry that they had that culminated in the 1989 um, Hawaii Ironman race, which they raced basically side by side, as you see in the picture, all day oh, wow. until the end. Um, and I think the, at the end, it was like less than a minute that separated the two. And I won't say who wins because <laughs> then, Spoilers. You know, spoil the book. <laughs> but um, the interesting part of, uh, of that is this race took place in 1989, but their marathon times at that race are still two of the fastest 
marathon wow. times ever at the Hawaii Ironman um, World Championships, which when you think about it is a really huge thing because think about all the advances that have been made in bike gear and aerodynamics and you know materials of bike frames and things like that, hydration, nutrition, that type of thing. Um, so that's kind of a testament to the athletes that these two guys actually are. Um, you may not ever have heard of them, but um, I think if, if, if you have a lot of readers that would typically read, you know, sports books, um, Lance Armstrong books, ultra marathon man runner books, uh, this book would have appeal to them. And um, I liked it a lot. Yeah. I read it relatively quick. I don't read a lot of sports, but everyone's always, if the story is good. I had to, you put, know, a, I had mean, to put a typical man thing. Man. <laughs> <laughs> this was the closest that, I could that come. Sounds interesting. Yeah. Okay. And I think uh, moving on from typical man book. Yes. Okay. So we're going to follow that up with my nonfiction choice, Amanda Palmer's uh, "The Art of Asking." Um, if you're not familiar with Amanda Palmer, she is a musician, formerly of the Dresden Dolls, uh, now uh, kind of uh, independent, uh, married to uh, writer Neil Gaiman. Uh, so I, I will be completely honest, I was not all that familiar with Amanda Palmer until she married Neil Gaiman. Um, and so I've, I've uh, been following uh, both of them now for a while. And um, one of the things uh, that many people do know about her, even if they're not familiar with her music, is she did a crowdfunding campaign a, a couple of years ago and asked for people to help fund her album and ended up with well over a million dollars. Uh, it was a very, very successful uh, Kickstarter campaign. And, but there was a backlash uh, to that because, you know, she's famous. What's she doing getting that much money from people and, and, and things like that? But she didn't start out famous, and her career path has not been exactly uh, the, the most uh, typical. Uh, her first gig, so to speak, was as a uh, seven-foot bride statue at, in, uh, in Boston at Harvard Square, Harvard Square, Boston Commons, I can't remember, big famous square there, where she would uh, uh, ask for tips in a hat and then she would hand people a flower. And uh, so she starts with the story of that, working up through Dresden Dolls, doing, uh, you know, asking people for help. She doesn't stay in hotels. She says, hey, I'm doing a gig in town. Anybody got a spare bed for me? And so it's kind of a story of her career and her relationship with, with, with Neil Gaiman uh, in that, you know, he was very famous and he was rich and she wasn't. So, you know, asking for help from him in some cases and how people are in a lot of cases afraid to just ask people for things. So it's the story of a musician. Uh, it's the story of a relationship. It's just also a story of asking people for help. Um, and actually, I guess there is one more talk. She she had a very famous TED talk, uh, yeah, where she kind of you know you just found that you just dug that up. Uh, where yeah, she was a TED talk first, but then she made yeah it. She yeah she then turned the into to the yeah. book, and she talks about the creation of that TED talk and being asked to do it and being asked to give it and the reaction to that. Uh, so it's it's just a, a wonderful book. Uh, I I re, kind of a I, I could have read it very quickly. I a little more savored it. Uh, you know, read a couple of chapters and a couple of chapters. Um, and just kind of a, a different look at a lot of things. And, and I'm, I'm kind of a fan of crowdfunding, so that's one of the reasons I want to read it too is to, you know, her experience. Now, most people who do crowdfunding are not going to get, end up with a million dollars, but sometimes you know, you're a little more successful than you anticipated, and how are you going to deal with that? Um, so I think a, a, a great book for your collection. A lot of different uh, people would uh, uh, benefit from, from reading this sort of story. It's not just your token nonfiction selection. Then. No, no, and it's not my token. I, I haven't read a lot of nonfiction lately, but I did read this one. So uh, uh, I, I, I did have to. I did feel I had to put in a nonfiction. I couldn't go all fiction. So. Well, I, I couldn't go all. You, you didn't go all nonfiction. Yeah, so there we go. Absolutely. All right, uh, John Douglas. This is a newer book by John Douglas called Law and Disorder, and I don't read a lot of fiction um, or mystery, but I like true crime. Mm -hmm. I like John Douglas, and um, I really like John Douglas's earlier book, um, The Cases That Haunt Us, um, which I would probably recommend more than this book, 
um, in the cases that haunt us, he, I don't know if you know who John Douglas is. He's an FBI profiler, one of the first <laughs> FBI profilers um, that ever existed. And he, so he's worked a lot of cases over the years. But in um, the cases that haunt us, he examines kind of historical um, or infamous murder cases um, that happened over the years and then, and then offers a, a profile of sure. who he believe the, what he believes the characteristics of the person that actually committed the crime might have been. Um, he talks about Jack the Ripper, Lizzie Borden, um, uh, you know, all those infamous cases, which the problem that I have with law and disorder is there are some new cases that he talks about that were very interesting, but he also spends time talking about cases that he's already talked about in the cases that haunt us, um, one of which is the John Benet Ra Ramsey case. Um, and a, and a couple others, and he offers no new information. Um, so there are some sections in here that are new. He talks about um, uh, false confessions, um, the death penalty, um, and that type of thing, um, and offers some case studies about false confessions and people. I think there was a case that he talks about in this book called the West Memphis Three. Yep, I'm um, familiar with that one. Yeah. <clears throat> that, um, where there was a false confession, and um, and uh, actually he was um, contacted by one of the defendants that was on death row, and and basically told them that he didn't want to, uh, wasn't going to help them, and later on was contacted by the wife of this person that was on death row, uh, Damien Eccles, I think is his name, um, and then because she had well, I don't know if it was because she had money, but because she got to him, um, then. You know, took on that case and and helped. I think ultimately to get him off of death row and and freed because yeah. he was actually innocent of the crime. And then later in the book, he devotes a number of pages to Amanda Knox, which we've been over and over again in in, in a lot of um, news reports. So I think that probably about half of this book is new material, which 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 I really enjoyed. But the other half was just trudging over stuff that. He had already covered in the cases that haunt us, but he has a way of writing that's very appealing. Um, it's easy to read. Um, it's interesting. He's an interesting guy. Um, he's had an interesting career, so I would recommend any book by John Douglas, not just this new one, Law and Disorder. And I put this up on the slide when I was currently reading it, so oh, I didn't know. Sure. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that he would cover a lot of the same material, uh, but I wanted to be honest and say that that was my experience. Sure. Mm -hmm. About half of it was stuff we really knew. Yeah, yeah, it was rehashing um, stuff that we already that he had already covered. It was nothing new. Mm -hmm. And so, if he would have offered new information, I think it would have been appropriate. But but not. I didn't really get that impression that there was anything new that he offered. Okay. All right. So yeah, I think this is my last book, and then I think we got one more from from Sam. Um, and I, I actually have this book in front of me. I'm, I'm in the middle of it, and, and I know we, we haven't generally been reading From the Flap, but I'm, I'm going to read part of From the Flap on this one because I want to get it right. Um, this, this is a kind of an alternate history, alternate universe sort of book. So technically it falls under science fiction, but it, it's, you, you would not think of it as science fiction per se unless you, you look at alternate history that way. Um, so let me just read uh, just a little bit from this. Uh, November 9th, 2001, Christian fundamentalists hijack four jetliners. They fly into the uh, Tigers and Euphrates World Trade Towers in Baghdad and a third into the Arab Defense Ministry in Riyadh. The fourth plane, believed to be bound for Mecca, is brought down by its passengers. The United Arab States declare a war on terror. Arabian and Persian troops invade the eastern seaboard and establish a green zone in Washington, D.C. So instead of 9-11, you have 11-9. Instead of the USA, you have the UAS. Right? But the book takes place in the summer of 2009 with an Arab homeland security agent interrogates a captured suicide bomber. The prisoner claims that the world they are living in is a mirage. In the, in the real world, America is a superpower, and the Arab states are just a collection of, quote, backward third world countries. A search of the bomber's apartment turns up a copy of the New York Times dated September 12, 2001, that appears to support his claim. 
It's like the Matrix. Mm. Yes. Sure. Other captured terrorists have been telling the same story. The president wants answers, but the investigator soon discovers he's not the only interested party. The gangster Saddam Hussein is conducting his own investigation, and the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, a war hero named Osama bin Laden, will stop at nothing to hide the truth. So, I really thought about this. I mean, this, this book is thought-provoking. It takes the experience of 9-11 we had and completely flips it on its head, but then throws in the maybe the completely flipped on its head isn't really what happened. So it's, you know, alternate history with a little matrix thrown in, you know, what is real. And, and I'm, I'm only halfway through. What, parallel universe. I, yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is. I have not finished this. Um, I, and, and I am looking forward to it. The paperback version that is out has one of those um, uh, the sections at the end for book clubs, you know, with questions yeah. to answer in the book clubs. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of maybe contributing this to our book club kit collection here. I want to finish it first, uh, see, uh, what it comes out. see what it comes out as. But it, it, I cannot say enough that this book is thought-provoking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is... You know, depending on you know your recollections of 9/11 and how you feel, it might affect you in very different ways. So I want to I want to give people a heads up Trigger there. Trigger warning. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah. Yes, I, I I guess I would say it, it, if if it, trigger warning would be appropriate in this case. Um, you know, it just it flips everything on its head and it makes you think. And I'm not going to tell you what you should think. Because like I said, everybody's going to experience this a little differently with their, with their background. Um, but I thought this was uh, a book I really want to include and, and talk about. I've not read anything else by this author. Um, I, I am enjoying him. Uh, it mentions this Bad Monkeys book on the bottom there. I might take a look at that once I'm through with this. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's going to make you think in, in many different ways. So I think that's, that's about all I will say uh, about that book. Uh, and then... Next. Where is our next? Well, there we go. There you go. There we go. And last but not least, have you read this series? I have this read the actually, first couple of issues. I have not. I. I it's, it's on the list. I've read the first three, not the fourth. I think. Okay. The, I think the fourth just came out. The collected. The collect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've I've read like yes. the first two issues, like so, even the first two parts of this. So, yeah. so this is. This is a series by Brian Vaughn. Um, you've heard of Brian Vaughn. Mm -hmm. uh, wrote Why the La he also wrote Why the Last Man series, which I have read, and a uh, standalone graphic novel called Cry to Baghdad, um, and probably many others. But those are the ones that I'm familiar with. And I'm going to interject here um, that the edited by in this slide in the bottom left is wrong, so that's my bad. It, mm. It's it's oh, poor okay. poor copying and pasting. So. Mm. So this is a graphic novel um, about, yeah, I don't even know how to start. Um, <laughs> the guy on the right is from one universe, uh, Marco is his name, and he, there's an intergalactic war between two um, different groups of people. He represents one of the groups. His wife um, on the left represents the other group. So they're people are at war and they meet when he's held captive in a prison and she's the the guard and they escape and um, get married and have the baby who's in the picture I think the baby's name is Hazel yes um, I guess I can't have that was wrong yeah Hazel. That, um, that is sometime narrates the story <laughs> um, and so they're kind of on the run because there's a couple of bounty hunters that are from each side that are trying to, to, to capture them. Um, and the thing I like about Brian Vaughn is, um, and I would say this is a graphic novel for adults. Um, he, his writing and the artwork, I think, is, is, is probably, uh, I would say, more adult-oriented than young adult, but um, that may be something. Was that your impression, it's, Kristen? It's a very... Older yeah, teens, I mean, yeah, yeah older I, teens. I, yeah. older, older High school teens. Age. Yeah. This is not a superhero comic book. No, this no, is, no, this is an adult all. story <laughs> yeah. in comic form. It just happens to be and, in that format. Yeah. 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 And, and the thing I like about Brian Vaughn is that he often puts his characters in 
death or near death situations. Mm -hmm. And they have this incredible wit um, that, you know, his, his, the, the thing I like about it the most is his writing necessarily more than the, than the artwork of the story. I'm not saying that the artwork's bad, mm -hmm. but, but that's the thing I like about Brian Vaughn is, is the writing. And I yeah, can't. many of the graphic novels I've been reading in comics, I get more into the writing than the. Well, yeah. the the art can go, the art can be great, but if the story sucks, it the art doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, right. it, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and this yeah. is a good story. I think mm -hmm. uh, an intriguing story. I can't wait to read the fourth volume, mm -hmm. um, which I think just came out. Yeah, it's actually an ongoing um, comic book series that, that come out. They're still coming out with new individual issues, but right. they're collected volumes right. into so you can get a whole, you know, a thicker, you know. And that's what, I, that's what I read. Issues all in one ones. together. Yeah. yeah, the collected ones are the ones that I read. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how I read Why the Last Man. I've got the, yeah. the hard covers and oh, great, yep. great story. Yep. Um, if you liked Why the Last Man, you would like this series, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I think yes, that's it. <laughs> um, those are our twelve books. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do. Yeah. These two did not know I put that slide up. So. <laughs> Um, and you know what? Look at that. We just about filled the hour too. So I mean, uh, I'll ask if there are any questions. I, I'm 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 not sure what you would question. We kind of gave our opinions. Um, I do know we have a couple of men in the audience. Uh, do they have a second to maybe throw up a title or two that they've read recently? Um, yeah. Is there anybody out there? Yeah. I know. I won't name you, but <laughs> <laughs> I know we do. This, this is guys read today. Um, do you guys have any particular titles that you would want to share or recommend for people to read? Um, we do have one question that came in, oh, which is okay. something completely unrelated to the books, but and I would think <laughs> myself too. As long as it's not surveys. Oh, <laughs> no, <laughs> not surveys. What? <laughs> Since you're here, Sam, what 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 software? Are we yeah, using? Okay. Stuff. I found a a piece of software called Wow Slider. <laughs> w o w Slider. S l i d e r. Um, and um, there's a free version and there's a paid version, mm -hmm. and um, there's it, there's a lot of customizations, so you don't have to do it exactly the way I did it. I I did kind of the page flipping because we were doing books Makes sense. sort of thing, and what it does is it creates um, a web page that so we're actually playing back a web page. We're just playing it back from a folder on the desktop at the moment, which you can see in the lower left hand. Well, actually, not in the projection. You can't. Um, no. Um, but um, so what it does is it saves an index.html file. It runs. It creates JavaScript to run it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on the website. It says awesome slider for non-coders. Yes, it right. Is. This is something that normally you might need to know coding to do, which yep. many of us like we don't. You don't have to. It's more. Of yeah. A so I basically course. said, you yeah. know, here are my 12 pictures. Um, you know, put them in this order. Make them look like this. Uh, make the transitions be this, and then it writes all the code and does it. Uh, and I just wanted to try it. I'm always looking for kind of different ways. Um, yes, I could have done this in PowerPoint, but, you know, why not try something new? Uh, I will find somewhere online to actually put this, so if you it want to. It just popped up and told uh, me it's, it's compatible with YouTube. Oh, you can upload it to YouTube. And, okay, well, I'm going to have to play with this. Um, <laughs> but um, so in the show notes, we will either at least make a list of the 12 books and or put up these slides. Uh, it's a support for YouTube and Vimeo. Huh. I mean, hmm. that might be in the pay for version too. I don't know. So we'll find out. But WOW Slider. W O W Slider. To the web page in the, in the um, and that's, um, So yeah, there's the answer to the question. I see some other comments mm -hmm. coming in. If I, yeah. Um, here's one. Bradley Scott says, I'll bite Midnight Rising by Tony Horowitz. <gasps> don't know that one. A okay. novel length profile of John Brown, the anti slavery radical, and his pre Civil War raid on the Harper's Ferry Federal Armory. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. okay. I, I do read a bit of American history. That, mm -hmm. that, that sounds like, uh, that sounds interesting. So. And, um, have you, and then just a question Have you read anything by Robert McCammon? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm a big fan of Robert McCammon. Uh, he, uh, his classic book, Swan Song, which was uh, compared a lot to um, The Stand by Stephen King. That's, that's from decades ago now. Uh, he has a current series he's working on um, that kind of takes place between the 17 and 1800s, uh, historical mysteries um, with a, a young what would now be called kind of a detective. They were kind of calling him a problem solver. Mm -hmm. uh, the first book in that series was Speaks the Nightbird. Mm -hmm. And I might have actually mentioned that in the one I did last year, uh, quite possibly. 
Uh, so yeah, I'm a big fan of Robert McCammon and, and, and buy his books when they come out too. So um, traditionally horror, the newer books are not horror. They're more thrillers, but historically set. Um, but he does have a new horror novel coming out in a couple of months from a small press I know too. So um, something to pay attention to. Another one says, I'm not a guy, but they want to share a book. They like, when uh -huh. books went to war. Uh, I think I have that, but I haven't read it yet. Um, I, I believe it's about reading in the military and, and the paperbacks, the creation of paperbacks and uh, distribution systems. And I'm really, if I'm Stories getting Stories that helped us win World War II. Okay, so reading during World War military II. Military history, yeah. Yeah, uh, but from the, the book perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Yeah, I think there's a military guy reading a book on the cover, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. So, yeah, that's all, that's that's in my. I, I won't even call it a pile of to be read at this oh. point. It's it's you know. When America entered World War II, we faced an enemy that had banned and burned over 100 million books and caused fearful citizens had to destroy many more. Outraged librarians launched a campaign to send free books <laughs> to American troops and gathered 20 million hardcover donations. Free. Nice. All right. Free. And so, hey, in 1943, the War Department and the publishing industry stepped in with an extraordinary program, 120 million small, lightweight paperbacks. Paperbacks, yep. The ones mm -hmm. that they could carry in their pockets. Um, yep. Early Yale, pocket books. So, yes. librarians. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, I know, I know I've got it. I know. Or maybe I have the e-version. It, it's somewhere in my to-be-read collection. Um, and today, the U.S. Navy issues e-readers. Yes, yes, that's right. They do. They just started that with pre with pre preloaded <laughs> selections. Yes, it's published in December. So it's okay. Brand new. Oh, it's brand new. Okay. I th maybe I have an advanced copy. Anyways, so I, I I'm familiar with it. Have not read it. So. All right. Um. Anything else coming in? That's all that came in so right. far. Yeah. We're we're at our hour. So. Yeah. That's perfect. Great. Thanks a lot, Sam and Michael. That was great. And yep. everyone for participating. Give us some more titles. Let me just switch over. Yeah. Sure. So that will um wrap us up for uh ourselves situated here okay remember <laughs> for... how I got out of the presentation. <laughs> uh, this week's Encompass Live um, the show is being recorded so it'll be available later along with um, any links to um, videos and things that were mentioned and whatever Michael does with his presentation yeah, I will, after lunch I will, <laughs> we'll get I will that all that. connected up so you have that available after um, with the recording um, it will be here on our Encompass Live website. This is our web page, and if you scroll right below our um, upcoming shows is our link to our archive sessions, and that's where you can get all of the recordings of all of our previous shows around here. Hundreds of them. Yes. I don't know how many. <laughs> no, you do well, 51 a year since 2000, 300 2009. 300 plus. So there's like, do the, the podcast is like on 318, and so it's about 300 at this point, I think. So. Um, that will wrap it up for today. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you join us next week when it is our regular monthly Tech Talk with Michael. He'll be back again. He comes in once a month to do, um, well, we do techie stuff all the time, but specifically there will always be a once a month Tech Talk um, that will definitely be something if you're more tech oriented. Um, and this week he's got um, Brian. Da, 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 da. Yep, Brian from the Evolve Pitchman. Project. Yeah. Yep. Um, Brian Pitchman will be on. He's was just recently at CS. It just ended yeah, a few like last week. days ago. Yeah, yeah last yeah. week. Um, Consumer Electronics Show in um, Vegas. Yep. And he's going to come on the show and tell us everything he learned there that has to do with libraries. Well, all, all, the cool, <laughs> all the cool new tech okay, that, yeah. that, that, that libraries might want to pay attention to. That you might, yes. yeah, yeah, be able so. to. So um, definitely sign up for that and for any of our other um, future shows that are here on our um, schedule. Also, if you are a Facebook user and Compass Live is on Facebook, uh, go ahead and go over there and like our Facebook page. You'll get notifications. You see here, I just do a reminder of you can log into the current day show. And when the recordings are available, I post them there. If you have any new recent additions to the show. Um, so if you are big on Facebook, go ahead and like us there and you'll be notified of what we're doing here. Um, let me just do one last check. We just have a few thank yous. And all right, that will wrap it up for today. Thank you very thank much, you. guys. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.